Shalom, Havarim. Hello, friends. Perhaps you have heard of the woman this week who was getting groceries, and she was running late. She had a lot of things on her plate, a lot of things going on. So she ran into the grocery store. She knew she had to hurry back to get one child from, from daycare. She had another child. She had to get back to the, get her off the school bus. She was rushing, got her groceries, got all those good things, including the ice cream. And she comes back to her car and finds she's locked the keys in the car. This woman didn't know what... <laughs> I saw that. Um, this woman didn't know what to do. So she just starts bawling her eyes out and decides she needs to pray. She prays that God will help her out of this situation. She's got these kids that she needs to get to. She's got this melting ice cream there in the cart. And as she's there, standing by her car, with the keys locked in it, this rough-looking dude walks up. He looks pretty scary. Not exactly the kind of person she was looking to have a conversation with in that parking lot as she's trying to hurry to get to her children. And as she's praying, she's praying... Um, that God will help her out of this situation. This man walks up and he opens up his jacket and he pulls out a coat hanger that has been straightened. He reaches into the car, like alongside the window and, you know, jimmies it a little bit. Some of you are like, you know, you know what, you know how to do it. Jimmies it a little bit and pops the lock open. Less than 20 seconds, he has the door open and this woman is just ecstatic. She just starts praying out loud. She says, thank you, oh God, for sending me this wonderful, nice man who has helped me out of this situation. Now I can get to my kids. Now I can get this ice cream home before it melts. And the man looks at her. He says, ma'am, I'm not a nice man. I'm not a good person. I'm actually a thief. I'm actually a bad person person. I've actually done this many times just to steal people's cars. And without missing a beat, the woman looks up to the heavens one more time, raises her hands and says, God, thank you for going above and beyond my request. You sent me a professional. (laughs) Today, we are continuing our sermon series within a sermon series by looking at the Lord's Prayer for the second time in two weeks. A number of weeks ago, before Lent kind of broke into the middle of our sermon series, we were talking about the Sermon on the Mount, what we call the Mennonite canon within the canon, central to the teaching of our denomination and our church, this long section of Jesus' continuous teaching on things like ethics, how we are to live here as his followers. So last week we came to the Lord's Prayer, and I realized that there was just too much to get into one sermon. So I decided we were going to make not one, but two sermons on prayer. And this week, as I'm writing, through, or writing this sermon up, and I'm trying to develop my ideas, I came to the realization that I can't cover it all in two sermons. <laughs> so... No, we're going to keep moving. We're going to not cover it all. I just wanted to recognize the fact that we are not going to be able to cover everything that could be said in this passage. We need to keep moving because I want to finish the Sermon on the Mount before we come to, um, to, to Pentecost at the end of next month. Uh, but today we are looking at Talking with God Part And I noticed that I have a different title for this in your bulletin than I do on the screen. Feel free to choose whichever one you like the best. So last week we looked at the practical side of prayer. I asked some questions that you've maybe asked yourself over the years. Um, We asked questions like how to pray. We talked about how long to pray. We talked about things like when, where, all these kind of questions about prayer. And do you remember where we came out on that? It doesn't really matter. I mean, it, not, it matters that you remember what I said. <laughs> but it doesn't matter how you pray. I th- said this, it's less important how you pray than that you pray. Whether you want to pray extemporaneously or you want to read a written prayer, I don't think God cares one bit. Like, that is more our personal preferences. It's like if you prefer hymns or worship songs, pews or chairs, Coke or Pepsi. Coke? Okay, we got some Coke. (laughs) I think it's mostly important that we follow the leading of Nike and just do it, right? (laughs) All right, so that was what we covered last week. Very practical approach to 
prayer. It's just a matter of doing it. Do whatever works best for you. It's mostly important that you do pray. So this week we're coming to something that gets a little bit more cerebral. This week gets a little more difficult. It gets a little bit more nerdy, as I like to call it. And I realize that as we look through this passage, um, it's something that's so familiar to us that we may skip over the difficulties in this passage because of familiarity. We just scoot right over it. And we have passages like this in verse 8. It says, For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Now, now, wait a second. If your father knows what you need before you ask him, then why even pray? Like, we have historically said things about God, that God is all-knowing, God is all-powerful, God is all-good, and yet God still wants us to come to him for these things that we need, to ask God for these things. And I think of myself, you know, we often use the metaphor of God being a father or a parent. Um, I'm, I'm not all-knowing. I'm not all-good. I'm not all-wise. My family can attest to that. Nobody said amen, all right? <laughs> like, I'm not all-good. I'm not a perfect father. But yet, I have never made my kids wait outside in the cold and say, Dad, can we come inside tonight and sleep inside? Mm-hmm. I've, no- <laughs> I've never made my, par- my kids beg for, like, basic necessities. Like, Dad, do we get socks this winter? You know, um, never made them ask for food or pray for their food, praying to me for these things. Like, why does God require this of us? Why should we pray? Now, I realize that as I was writing this sermon, so often in our life, at least in my life, I've been fed answers that I don't really like. I've been given responses to these kinds of questions that really don't fit my real lived experiences. Am I alone here? Um, For instance, whenever you may be praying for a sick family member, imagine your grandfather or grandmother is dying from cancer. You pray really hard for that individual and they still die anyway. And you hear people say things, well, I guess you just didn't pray hard enough. Or you hear about somebody that's struggling with with, um, their work, with their job, or their house payment. They just can't make ends meet. And they pray to God, God, help us out here. And and then somebody says, well, maybe you have some sort of unconfessed sin in your life that's keeping God from answering your prayer. I actually really don't like those answers. I think that does more to hurt a person's faith than anything else. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to ask some more questions. And maybe you're out there, you're like excited right now. You're thinking, okay, Kevin's going to answer all the questions I've ever had about prayer. Are you ready for that? Yes, you're going to be disappointed today. (laughs) Because I have more questions than I have answers. And I think that's okay. I would rather have more questions with no answers than to have those force-fed, cookie-cutter answers that actually do more harm to a person's faith than help them. And I'm going to guess the fact that you are here today suggests that you are in that same boat. If you're tuning in online, it's because you're tired of some of the easy answers. You want to dig deeper. Now, I realize that today you may leave with more questions than you had when you came in. I may introduce you to some questions that you had never considered before. And if that messes with your faith a little bit too much, I apologize. But I think it's actually helpful for us to dig deeper to ask these questions. And if you find the things that I said today to be totally off the wall and not helpful, that's okay just to leave them here and say, eh, that's Kevin's opinion. We'll leave it here. It, it is my opinion, and you're welcome to leave it here. But if it helps you like it has helped me, then I think that we have done our job as a church. We're discovering new ways to think about these things, new ways to dig deeper and to explore so today, these are the four things that I'm going to explore. Yes, you're getting a four-part sermon, a sermon, four-part sermon. You're used to these three-point sermons. You're getting four-part four, four part harmony, four-point sermons. Well, let's see if I can make it harmonious. These are the four things we're going to try to cover this morning. Why pray? Because prayer changes me. Why pray? Because prayer changes God, kind of. Why pray? Because prayer is an invitation And why pray? Because prayer is a form of discipleship. And I also realize that there is a meal today after church, so I can keep you long, right? Yeah, okay. (laughs) We will try to move quickly through some of these. 
I should also note that these two in the middle, I have preached entire sermons on these two points. So if you want more information about what I'm presenting here today, uh, you can kind of go through our archives. I can send you information if that is helpful as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the very American thing, and we're going to start with ourselves. Why pray? <laughs> because prayer changes me. Roger's like, you ain't lying. <laughs> you didn't say a thing. You said it with your eyes. <laughs> All right, so I shouldn't have to convince you of this. Like, we know that prayer changes us. And I should also go back. Those things are not mutually exclusive. They do overlap quite a bit. But we know that prayer changes us. And as I mentioned here with the kids, there are times when the Bible simply tells us if you are heavy, burdened, and like just weighed down, to bring those things and give them to God. And I mentioned to the kids one of these passages. We find it in Philippians 4 verses 6 through 7. Paul writes, Do not be anxious about anything. Easy for you to say, Paul. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I think we can expand that. We can extrapolate that as well. It's not just with anxiety. Anybody here dealing with anger? Don't raise your hand. That was a hypothetical question. Anybody dealing with anger? Lay it at the feet of God. Are you dealing with with depression? Bring it to God. Are you dealing with other struggles? Bring those things to God. And there's this promise here that God will transform you. God will release you of those struggles. Now, I also want to say that this is within limits. Like, if you are dealing with extreme anxiety, extreme depression, things, of like, things like that, there is no shame whatsoever in going to see a professional. I'm not simply saying just pray it away. I believe that God also puts those professionals in our lives for a reason. Those people are a gift from God. But with the everyday kind of anxieties, the everyday kind of depression, those sorts of things, the Bible tells us, bring those to God and leave them there at his foot. So we come to the Lord's Prayer, and we realize that there's a lot in here about changing us as well. We just don't know where to look for it without a little extra help. For instance, okay, Jesus has this beginning, this the prelude to the Lord's Prayer, where he's talking to the disciples, and he says to them, you know, God knows what you need before you even ask. And then what does Jesus go forward and do? He tells them to ask for things like bread and forgiveness. Well, well, Jesus, you just said God already knows what I need, so why am I coming to God for bread and forgiveness? Furthermore, isn't God the one who made me? Like, God knows I need bread because God created me to need to have nourishment and bread. And what about forgiveness? Like, haven't I already been forgiven? We talk about the grace of Christ covering our past, present, future sins. Like, do I need to come every day for this forgiveness? Now, I realize that when I read the Lord's Prayer and I read Jesus telling his disciples to ask for their daily bread, I'm reading it through a 21st century lens. And so are you because you are living in the 21st century in a very Western context. So when you hear the phrase daily bread, what are you thinking of? You're like, is that gluten-free bread? Like, no, I, I can't have bread because I'm, I'm on keto right now, trying to drop a few pounds. Or is that, is that whole wheat bread, you know, unleavened bread? We've got all these kind of questions about bread, right? This is really important stuff to us in the 21st century. But when Jesus was speaking to his disciples in the first century, what do you think they thought of when they heard the phrase daily bread? They probably thought of the Israelites wandering through the wilderness and how God fed them every day with this manna. They would wake up, the bread was right outside their, I was going to say door, but they were camping, so outside their tents. Um, So every morning they woke up, and God provided for them what? Provided for them daily bread. I don't think that what God is trying to do here, or what Jesus is trying to do, is trying to remind us that we need to ask God for these things. I think what's going on here is that when we pray, 
we're trying to remind ourselves of what God has already done. And I say it like this. Maybe praying for things like our daily nourishment and forgiveness aren't meant to remind God that we need these things. Maybe this prayer is meant to remind us that we need God for these things. Yeah, that one works, right? That was, that was almost poetic. You know? <laughs> Who wrote that? Come on now. No, like I, 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 not, not just because I wrote it, but I, I get, that makes sense to me. Maybe we're not trying to remind God that we need these things. We're reminding ourselves that we need God for these things. That, in my mind, is a way that prayer changes us. How about the next one? I'm going to get a little contentious here now, I know, because prayer changes God. Now, here's the thing about that phrase. I, I say some things just to be a little bit of like a get your attention, grab your, you know, make sure you're paying attention here. I'm trying to be just a little bit of a troublemaker um, because I do know the passages in the Bible that say God doesn't change. Malachi, it was Malachi 3, 6. I have it written down here somewhere. Malachi 3, 6, part A, says very clearly, I have this memorized, it says, I, the Lord, do not change. Okay. We also read in the New Testament that Jesus is God in human flesh. And in Hebrews, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, sounds to me like God doesn't change. Now, the thing about that is I would say that God's attributes do not change. Who God is does not change. It's not like God is loving one day and the next day he's a real jerk. It's not like one day God is righteous and just and holy and the next day he's, you know, some pagan living it up out there in the world. I don't know what pagans even do. I don't even know what a pagan is. But, but God, God's personality, God's, God's attributes do not change. What we see in the Bible time and time again, though, is that God's plans change. What God is going to do changes. And the go-to example for this is found in the story of Abraham pleading with God to spare the city of God, Sodom and Gomorrah. So, uh, God has said he's going to wipe out these cities, and Abraham's kind of like the voice, I, don't, I was going to say the voice of reason, that's not quite fair to say to God, um, but Abraham comes in, he's like, you're not, are you really going to destroy the whole city if there's like 50 people who are righteous in the city? And God's kind of like, ah, okay, no, not for 50. If you find 50 righteous people in the city, I won't destroy it. And what does Abraham do? He says, well, 50 is a lot of people. How about 45? <laughs> and God's like, okay, if you're 45, if there's 45 righteous people, I won't destroy it. And then Abraham launches into his auctioneer voice. <laughs> and he's like going backwards here. Like, all right, how about 40? 40, 40, 40, give me 40, 40, 40, give me 40, 40, 40, 40, yep. And then how about 30, 30, 30? Do I have 30 in the back? I saw your hand, JR. Yep, that counts. Uh, and then he goes down 20 and 10. And finally, God says, okay, if you find 10 righteous people, or if I find 10 righteous people in the city, I will change my plans, and I will not destroy the city. Unfortunately, they didn't find 10 righteous people in the city. Um, but we see God making these changes, making these movements, because Abraham pleads with him. Because Abraham brings this petition to God. It changes God's plans. It changes God's mind. Now, some people have said, well, God already knew there weren't 10 righteous people there. I want to say that's a little misleading for God to say and just kind of play with Abraham in this way. And that doesn't really line up with my understanding of who God is either. I think what this shows is that Abraham's pleading with God actually makes a difference. And we find it elsewhere as well. We know the story of Jonah, mostly because of that big fish that ate him up. The story is that Jonah was to go to preach to the Ninevites to call them to repentance because if they didn't repent, God was going to destroy the people. And Jonah goes to the people after this little, little detour and he starts preaching to the people. And this we find in Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. He relented. He changed his plans. And that's not the only place. That also, you know, we have, um, so we have the story of the golden calf in the book of Exodus. God's going to wipe out the people because they have really messed up. <laughs> I 
I still, I scratch my head at that. God just led you out of captivity through the parted waters. And what do you do? Let's make a golden calf. Well, God's pretty angry about that as well. God's going to destroy the people. Exodus 32, 14. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. And if that word relented trips you up, because I know it's a weird one, like it's not one that I use, I think that the NIV, the other one was NIV as well, the translators of the NIV are just a little bit scared to use the word or phrase, God changed his mind. Other translations will just come right out and say it. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. These passages show that God does change his mind. God does change his plans. It shows at times that it's the result of our prayers and petitions that God changes his mind. Now, here's the thing. You can disagree with me on all that. I know there's passages in the Bible that talk otherwise, that God doesn't change. But I think ultimately, when we get down to the practical side of it, we all believe that God does change his mind and God does change plans. Even the staunchest Calvinist believes that God will change his mind. And when I talk about Calvinists, I'm speaking specifically of people here that believe that God has already made his mind up. God has made up um, the plans that are going to unfold in this world. Like every last detail. Like God knew that Sarah Dell was going to lay over backwards like that and stretch out her tummy while Dwayne tickled it during my sermon. Like God planned that. God willed that to happen. It wouldn't have happened if it wasn't God's will that that happened. You've heard people that believe these sorts of things, right? I don't think that that's practical, and I don't think anybody actually believes that on a practical level. Because if we believe that God causes everything that happens, and it only happens because God willed it to happen, and God's will cannot be changed, the question that I have is, why do we pray at all? Like, why do we look at our prayer list and we pray for people that have cancer? If God has already determined that this person will have cancer and will die, why are we praying for that? It's already been determined and we can't change God's mind. Why do we pray for this person who lost their job that they might find another source of employment or income if we think that God caused this to happen, this was God's will, and God already has decided what will happen in that situation? Now, I think at a practical level, every praying person believes that they can have some sort of influence on how things unfold, how God acts in this world. So I don't think that prayer changes who God is. Prayer doesn't change like God's attributes. Prayer probably doesn't even change the major like overarching narrative of what God is going to do in restoring the world to making it as it was intended to be. But these day-to-day kind of things, I believe we can change God's plans. And that is a huge responsibility for all of us. All right, next one. You thought that one was a little contentious? How about prayer as an invitation? An invitation to whom? An invitation to God. And a couple years ago, I preached on this as well. It's a full-length sermon out there in the internets if you really want to look it up. Um, And I used a different phrase here, and that was maybe a little more contentious. I did it again to kind of get people's attention, and I still think I was right. (laughs) Some other people didn't think I was right. I used the phrase then, rather than saying that prayer is an invitation to God for God to act in our lives, I said that prayer was giving God permission to act in our lives. And I still stand by that. I just won't say that that clearly here today. Um, Because whenever I did say that prayer is an invitation, or sorry, prayer is giving permission to God to act, one of my friends online responded, and um, kind of just laid into me a bit there. You know, we think we need to give God permission to do something. God is God. You know, who do we think we are? We have to give God permission. And it just kind of showed that this person didn't really listen to my whole um, argument or that I didn't make it as well as I thought I did. Or maybe I was just wrong. I don't know. But what I mean by this is that God, when we pray to God, we are inviting God to come into our lives and to act in our lives in a way that God normally wouldn't do without our invitation. And all of this comes down to the concept of free will. Now, my friend that was kind of pushing back on me, um, this person comes from a, a Calvinist perspective. Again, where they think that everything has been predetermined by God, that God causes all things that happen to happen. 
But in the Anabaptist Mennonite tradition, this is actually central to our belief system that we believe in free will. The early Anabaptists believed that it was up to each individual person to make the decision to follow Jesus. Your parents can't make that choice for you. Uh, the government can't make that choice for you. You make the choice to follow Jesus. And we go all the way back, like, where does this come from? Um, go all the way back to the first family in the Bible, Adam and Eve. God made Adam and Eve, these first human beings, put them in the Garden of Eden, made all the, the plants and the animals, and there was one tree, God says, that you cannot eat from this tree. And then God did what? God made them eat of that tree and then kicked them out of the garden. No, no, God gave them the free will, and they chose to break what the, one, the one commandment that they had. They chose to break it. Um, so we go throughout history, throughout the Bible, we find all these stories about people's free will. And one of the ones that we constantly come back to in the Mennonite church is this story that we find in the book of Joshua, Joshua 24. The people have been wandering through the wilderness. They're coming right up to the edge of the promised land. And this is the words that we find in Joshua. These are the words from Joshua 24, 15. Uh, so they're ready to cross over the prom in the promised land. They're dedicating themselves to God. Joshua says, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Wait a second. What's that say? Can somebody read it from the back. Choose for yourselves. Thank you. Oh, it sounds like free will to me, right? Well, one thing I want to just kind of be careful of is noting that there's no such thing as absolute free will. Because as these people were entering into the promised land, they were given the choice, either come with us, dedicate yourself to God, get rid of your idols and cross into the promised land, or stay out here in the wilderness by yourself and worship your false gods. Like, is that really much of a choice? It's, uh, I won't say what I was just thinking. Um, there's other times, like, we, we can't force somebody into making a decision and call that free will. But I want to say that that's not the absence of free will. That's just kind of a limitation on our free will. What we have to remember is that our situations and our context always affect the level of free will that we have. We maybe don't always have absolute free will, but we do have choices that we can make. I would love to be a professional basketball player. I have the free will to make that decision. What I don't have is the ability. Like, so there's, there's some limitations on our free will. Uh, let's see, I had one more. Oh, in, New, in the New Testament. You guys are going to be late for lunch. In the New Testament, Jesus talks about calling these disciples. And they all come up with these different excuses. He's, he's got the 12 disciples. He's calling additional disciples. One of them says, well, I would totally come follow you, but I just brought, bought some land and I need to go check it out. Another one's like, I would be your disciple, but I bought some oxen and I, I don't know, <laughs> I want to try them out in the field. And the other guy's like, I just got married. And Jesus is like, I don't need an explanation. Like there's, there's all these excuses that people make. And the thing that I see there is they have the free will to go or not to go, to follow Jesus, or not follow Jesus. So the question I have then is, what does any of this have to do with prayer? Well, see, I believe that one of the reasons that prayers are not always answered in the way we want them to be answered is because we have free will, and because other people have free will as well. This may be a shocker. The people around you, they have free will. If you have ever been in a relationship with anybody at all, at any kind of level, you know that that person has free will. If you have children, you know they have free will. <laughs> so when we pray, what we are essentially doing is we are giving some of our free will up to God. When we invite God to act in our lives, we're praying that he will take some of our will and align it with his own. The words that Jesus prays here, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is saying, Jesus, come into my life and transform my will, my free will, into what your will is. So it's a giving up a little bit of that free will. And again, and the reason I think that so many of our prayers aren't answered is because other people have free will. Don't raise your hand, but have any of you ever prayed for a certain person to fall in love with you? 
dear God, can you please make Sally fall in love with me? I think she's swell. I think she's beautiful. She's the best. God, just, I would do anything. Just, just help Sally fall in love with me. Oh, why do you think that prayer isn't always answered? Well, because Sally has free will. <laughs> And God has set these boundaries. By giving us free will, that means that that person also has free will. And God's not going to take away Sally's free will just because you have a crush on her. And maybe Sally has a a crush on Johnny, and Johnny's dating Kim. And all these things are going on. There's all these different circles. I know, it's like middle school all over again. All these people are, are here, and they've all got free will. And God isn't going to take that person's free will just so that Sally will like you. Let's ratchet it up one more notch and get real, real here. Real, 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 real. We probably all know what it's like to pray for somebody that's dealing with things like addiction, substance abuse. We pray, God, help that person to get over it, to put down the bottle, to throw away the needle, whatever that addiction may be. What do we always say about that person? They aren't going to get better until they make the decision for themselves. We can keep praying to God that that person will get better, but they still have free will. And when we ask these questions about why prayers aren't answered, I come back to this image of an iceberg. And you hear the metaphor used frequently about the iceberg. They say something like only 10% of an iceberg is above the water. And and Ben's been posting a lot about Titanic lately. The Titanic probably found that out the hard way. Um, only like 10% of an iceberg is above the water, 90% is below the water. And I think that when we pray to God, what we talk about, what we ask of God, that's like the 10% that's on the top. But on the bottom, we have all those other things circulating, the free will of other people, all those other things are interacting with one another and preventing our prayers from being heard or responded to in the way we would like them to be responded to. All right, long enough. Let's move on to the last one. (laughs) Why pray? I see prayer as a form of discipleship. Now, I have to give credit to Mr. Tate Love. He's not here today, but I know he'll be watching later online. So, um, Tate, I am giving you credit for giving me this idea. um, To see prayer as discipleship. And in the Mennonite church, I'm not sure if Tate really meant it this way, but I'm going to give him extra credit because it was like, I thought it was kind of, don't tell him I said this, I thought it was kind of brilliant even if he didn't mean it this way. Um, So we're sitting in a prayer meeting one time or a a board meeting of some sort, and Tate is giving the opening devotions, and he's struggling with some of these same questions about why pray. And he says something very simple, but I think it was very profound as well. Again, I don't know if he really meant it this way, but I'm going to take it this way. Um, He said, well, one of the reasons that we pray is because Jesus did. Because Jesus did. Okay. I'm not sure that Tate understood at that moment just how right he was. This is a part of our Anabaptist history as well. Because throughout Anabaptist history, we have not simply made Christianity about a certain belief. We have made Christianity a way of life. It is discipleship. It is following Jesus in word and deed. We lift up not only the words of Jesus, but also the actions of Jesus, because Jesus is believed to have been perfect and without sin. Jesus was therefore our perfect model for how we are to live our lives. The 16th century Anabaptist Dirk Willem, nope, it's not wrong, sorry. Oh, this is the slide I showed last week. Um, Just some of the ways Jesus prayed, and he prayed a lot. Um, The 16th century Anabaptist Hans Denk, different guy than Dirk Willem's, Um, said this. He said, no one can truly know Christ unless they follow him in life. And that may sound very familiar to you if you've ever seen this little picture here. That is the footer that's on our website, on the Stanton Mennonite Church website. It's on every page. We have that one on the bottom of the page. You can check it out. It's there. Simply affirming that if you truly want to be a, um, if you truly want to know Christ, You must follow him daily in life. This is central to the Anabaptist way of knowing and living our lives. So we look at what Jesus did, and we look at what Jesus said. And Jesus taught us to do things like love our enemies, to forgive people, to go the extra mile, to um, give to the poor, give to the needy, to not return violence for violence, um, fist for fist, uh, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Jesus taught us to do these things, or to not do these things. 
And not only did he say them, he lived it out. Jesus turned the other cheek. Jesus forgave others. He loved his enemies. He was nonviolent. And you know what else Jesus did? He prayed. He prayed a lot. So why do we pray? Because Jesus commanded it of us, but also because Jesus prayed. And to be a disciple of Jesus means that we too will pray. So why do we pray? We pray because it changes us. Why do we pray? We pray because we have an influence over God. Like not, necess- not all powerful like over God like that, like that but, but God listens to our prayers. God is influenced by our prayers. Why do we pray? We pray because we are inviting God into our lives to act upon our lives. We are giving up some of that free will. And why do we pray? Because that is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Let us pray. God, we thank you for...